So for those of you who may not know, we are in um, our second week of a series uh, called Unnamed, um, dealing with the unforgettable women uh, in the Word of God. And um, I want to kind of jump straight in because we've got a lot of ground to cover today. Um, that's cold for it's going to be long. Um, servers lock the doors. <laughs> now, um, yeah, it's going to be long. It's a little teachy. Um, so forgive me if I don't holler. I might holler once or twice, but um, but overall, I want I want you to really get this. I believe that the Lord wants to do something in us today. Amen. Amen. So we're going to Acts the 16th chapter. Um, I'm going to read verses 16 through 26. This is one of those. I really want you to read the whole chapter. Um, and I would read the whole chapter if I was provoked, but um, I'll leave you alone today. 16 through 26 is our focus for today. It says this, it says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in, attack, in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they, were, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were fastened. Amen. Our topic for this morning is triggered. Triggered is our topic uh, for this morning. You could be seated in the presence of the Lord. Triggered is our topic for this morning. And so to be, to be triggered, I want to start off making sure that we have a, um, a definition, a working definition. To be triggered typically refers to experiencing an intense emotional, psychological, and sometimes even a physical reaction in response to certain events or happenings. It is an experiencing an intense emotional psychological and sometimes physical reaction in response to certain events or happenings and the the responses to these triggers look different from person to person but most often it is in direct direct connection to past traumas past fears or beliefs once triggered, many people feel overwhelmed, they feel anxious, they feel angry, they feel stressed, they have panic attacks, they, the heart can start racing, some people start sweating and even shaking in some instances as a result of their triggers. And now this, this, this idea of being triggered has, it has seemingly gained some traction in, in recent years and it's, it's pretty common to hear it at this point. Everybody's triggered by something and I get that. But what I think is important to recognize is that being triggered isn't a new phenomenon. Being triggered is a normal part of being human. It's normal. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's normal. Come on, tell it because they think, tell somebody else because they think that they're different. Look at them and say, being triggered is normal. It's normal. However, I am, I am less concerned about leaning into the idea that we can be triggered since we already knew that. We just got a name for it. I want to challenge us not to just acknowledge triggers, but to develop healthy ways of responding to them. I was wondering how many amens I would get right there. You don't have to be bound to a negative response to your triggers. 
You get to choose how you respond to what is happening. So let me, let me share with you two examples from history that shows us contrasting responses to negative situations. Let's, let's consider Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela is known to the modern world as the premier leader who fought against apartheid in South Africa. He himself endured decades of imprisonment and oppression under the apartheid regime. But despite his triggers, which undoubtedly were brought on by facing unimaginable hardships, he faced wrongful imprisonment, he was also tortured, he chose to respond to his triggers with grace, with forgiveness, and with a commitment to justice despite the injustices that he faced. His resilience and his capacity for reconciliation led to the dismantling of apartheid and he became the president of the very country where these atrocities were committed against him. Now in stark contrast, we find the story of Adolf Hitler, a man who rose to power in Germany during a time of economic turmoil and societal unrest. Now, when he was faced with adversity, Hitler responded too. But Hitler responded with hatred and bigotry and a thirst for power. And his leadership led to one of the darkest chapters in human history. Now, if you look at their lives, both, both figures face negative circumstances that people would consider to be triggering. But their responses couldn't have been more different. We can either allow our triggers to lead us to further harm and destruction, or we can rise above it and choose to let it fuel us and push us to better. Some of you are getting triggered right now. I know it. We're going to deal with it later. And I recognize that this challenges our contemporary understanding of being triggered. In our culture, being triggered often leads to a quick or a rash reaction, and then we feel justified by our outburst of emotions or by our running and hiding in a corner somewhere. But what if being triggered was designed to lead you down a different road? What if instead of succumbing to negativity, we allowed our triggers to propel us to change? Okay. We all have triggers. We have moments, we have words, we have situations that provoke a response within us, but you don't have to be bound by your triggers. You can, tell, you can let them steal from you or you can let them serve you. And the choice is yours. Our desire is that they would lead us to a space of growth and development. And so when our text opens... Paul and some of the early church leadership have already been triggered by their encounters with Jesus to embark on a missionary journey through the modern world, spreading the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth as they were commissioned to do. They were triggered to do that. Somebody say they were, they were triggered. During this journey, they eventually come to a city in Macedonia called Philippi. This is the same city where Paul established the Philippian church that he later writes a letter to and it becomes a part of our New Testament scriptures. And as they were heading to prayer in Philippi, they were met by a slave girl who, according to the Bible, had a spirit of divination. She had a spirit of divination. She was a fortune teller. She was a psychic. And she was in double bondage. The first form of bondage is obvious. She was a slave. And unfortunately, this was not incredibly uncommon in that day, especially for young girls. A, a, a large percentage of people in cities were servants and slaves, which was obviously as low as you can get. No rights, limited freedom, and definitely not citizens of the Roman Empire. No real liberties. You just worked for the one who owned you. But not only was she a slave to her owners, she was a slave to Satan. She was a slave to the spirit that had overcome her. The irony of this, the irony of this is that her physical bondage is in part due to her bondage to the spirit. Yeah. All right. Here's the thing. Slavery is about economics. Slavery is about economics. You have to produce something in order to remain profitable. And so her owners were profiting from her bondage in more ways than one. Ownership is all about profits. Look at somebody and say, ownership is about profits. I'm going somewhere. There is a valuable, there is a value to the person's labor. There is a, a value, there is a profit that is gained as a result of the person. And this is why the enemy wants to own you. Because if he owns you, he profits from you. If he controls you, 
He benefits from your labor. You are a slave to him. He doesn't just want you. He wants what you produce. He wants the profit that comes from you. He wants to enslave you. Okay. Romans, the sixth chapter, verses 16 through 18 says this. It says, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Then it says this. It says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey your heart from the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. One more time. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And maybe this doesn't apply to everybody, but for those of you who have been set free from sin those who are no longer in bondage those who no longer serve sin can you offer up something to the God who's freed you can you give praise to the one who's delivered you can you give praise to the one who broke the chains of bondage off of your life I know who I used to be I was a slave to the sin that had me bound but then came a man named Jesus and he broke every chain touch a few people and say he broke every chain every chain every chain every chain every chain come on come on just a few more seconds just the people who remember when they were bound come on just the folks that got a real good memory I remember where I was I remember what I did I remember what I couldn't stop doing but he set me free. He set me free. He set me free. Now, I don't want you to get it twisted because some of y'all ain't get excited yet. I ain't talking about celebrating walking perfectly. We're not talking about that. We are celebrating walking free. And there's a difference. Perfect ain't the same thing as free. God, I might stumble, but I'm not stuck. I might slip, but I'm not sinking. I wish somebody would open up your mouth and say, oh, Lord, I know I'm not perfect, but thank God I'm not in chains. I'm not in chains. I'm not in chains. He broke the chain. Somebody said, I'm no longer a slave. Now open up your mouth and glorify him. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer... I'm no longer a slave. Y'all can sit down. I'm no longer. Thank God I'm free. Uh oh. Somebody, real quick, just shout, Thank God I'm free. Thank God I'm free. Paul, Paul and Silas, Luke and Timothy were there also. They, they encountered this. They encountered this slave girl that the Bible says had a spirit of divination. She had a spirit of divination. This, this, this woman is not only owned by people, she is owned by the spirit that is holding her captive. The, the, the Greek word for divination in this passage is pneuma pythona, which literally translates to spirit of python. And so this spirit of divination, this, this python spirit was believed to enable the girl to predict the future or offer insights beyond natural means. Divination was and still is a widespread practice among many cultures and they make attempts to gain insight or knowledge about future events or hidden truths through some supernatural means. And so we see this in the form of psychics and we see this in the form of mediums and we see this in people who use rituals to communicate with spirits and to talk to the dead. The spirit of Python, I want to be clear, it, it represents a force that seeks to suffocate and constrict just like the snake that it is named after. 
In our, in our lives, the spirit of Python, it, it manifests through various triggers and events, emotions and circumstances that, that, that trap us in cycles of fear and anxiety and bondage. Now, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want you to have an understanding of the characteristics that are associated with the spirit of Python. Number one, constriction and suffocation. In, in, in the same way that a python wraps itself around its prey, this, this spirit seeks to constrict and suffocate people, specifically the children of God, and hinder them from experiencing spiritual freedom and spiritual growth. Number two, control and manipulation. And so as we see this girl, this girl is possessed by the spirit of divination. Those influenced by the spirit of Python, may, they may exhibit a form of spiritual manipulation, seeking to control others for their own gain and to hinder the work of God. Number three, false prophecy and deception. The spirit of Python may operate through false prophecy or deceptive practices leading individuals astray from the truth of God's word and causing confusion and spiritual bondage. And the last one is a resistance to spiritual authority. Those that are influenced by the spirit of Python, Python may resist or oppose spiritual authority figures seeking to undermine their influence and disrupt the work of God in the lives of believers. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because you ought to look for it. Overall, the spirit of Python represents a, a spiritual force that seeks to hinder, restrict, and manipulate individuals in their relationship with God and with others. It is not just about what happens in your relationship with, to God, but there is something that the enemy knows. He understands that when we are divided amongst each other, that it's still a gateway for him. And it is important for believers to discern and resist and destroy the influence of this spirit in their lives and in the lives of others. Put a pin in that. This, this girl, this slave girl, by her condition, was triggered to proclaim truths about Paul and his people. And, and, and on the surface... These truths could have, it could have likely boosted their credibility in the eyes of some of the people. But although this woman was shouting what, what would seem to be a compliment about Paul, the spirit behind what she was shouting was sent to distract and undermine the people of God. Okay. She was, she was shouting out the truth about Paul and Silas. She was identifying them as servants of the Most High God. But despite the truth in her words, there was deception in her voice. It was not a voice that was guided by the Holy Spirit. I feel like we're going to bust something up today. It was not a voice that was guided by the Holy Spirit, but by a spirit of divination. It was a voice meant to distract. It was a voice sent to disrupt. It was a voice sent to deceive. And I am taking this time to speak about this because in this hour, we need to be hyper vigilant about identifying the sources of the voices that we listen to. I, I'm seeing I'm, I, I'm seeing a lot of people that are getting caught up. Y'all are sharing some Facebook posts and some Instagram posts from some people that have gained popularity. We've got some popular voices, both sacred and secular, and we are trusting these voices to be good sources. But the reality is that it ain't nothing but a python. I want, to be, I want to be abundantly clear. Not every voice, listen, not every voice that speaks the truth is of God. That's a tricky one. I'm going to say it again. Not every voice that speaks the truth is of God. The enemy is crafty, y'all. And he will use truth to disguise his lies. First John 4 and 1, I don't want to get stuck. First John 4 and 1, it says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets, oh God, 
Many false prophets have gone out into the world. It is majorly important then that you understand the intentions behind the voice. I'm not just listening for what you said. I'm listening for what's behind what you said. This girl's owners, the owners of this girl, they were using her for their own gain. And so their intentions were not to spread the truth of God. They could care less about God. They wanted to profit from the deception. And so in our own lives, we have to be careful about voices that have hidden agendas. God, help me today. We have to be careful about voices that use truth for their own gain. Does this voice seek to glorify God or to glorify itself? Does this voice lead me closer to God or closer to the one that's speaking the word? The voice of this girl, I feel conviction in the room. The voice of this girl was causing a disturbance for Paul, even though she was speaking the truth. He didn't need a demon to write a reference letter on his behalf. And her confession had the potential to draw attention away from the message of salvation that Paul and Silas were preaching and to start causing confusion and chaos. It would be confusing for Paul and Silas to be introduced by a slave girl with a spirit of divination. It would indicate to the people who knew her or those who just saw her madness that she was a representative of theirs. And this is the issue we have with Christianity right now. God help me. There are deceiving spirits. Man, y'all got to watch. There are deceiving spirits that are speaking out on behalf of Christ and his church. And now those of us who really do represent him are battling against the reputation that has been tarnished by those who spoke the words of truth from a place of deception. People who said that they came in the name of the Lord, but really were using his name to build their own name. Anyone using the name of God to build their own name is a deceiver and is operating in a spirit of Python. There is only one name that's deserving of glory. There's only one name that's deserving of honor. There's only one name that's deserving of praise. Jesus, you be lifted up. Jesus, you be magnified. Jesus, you be glorified. He said, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up, from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. You better watch what name is being lifted. If you never know my name, you better lift the name of Jesus. Ain't no power in my name. Power is in the name of Jesus. Somebody open up your mouth and shout Jesus. Come on, say it like you need it. Shout the name Jesus. There's a lot of names being called on even in the church even in christianity but let every other name fade away and let the name of jesus be lifted high lift him 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 yeah yeah come on stay there for a second come on lift the name of jesus come on lift the name of jesus Slip the name of Jesus. Still he speaks from eternity. Still he speaks. Jesus, we lift it. I come against every demonic force that tries to use the name of Jesus to build their own platforms. Oh God, that use it to build their own names. Use it to build their own kingdom. It must come down in Jesus' name. Every kingdom that is not of God, it must come down in Jesus' name. Every kingdom that secretly competes against the kingdom of God, we shut it down in the spirit and we come against it in the name of Jesus. Everybody, open up your mouth and give God one more time to pray. Coming down in Jesus' name. It's coming down in Jesus' name.
It's coming down in weight. It's coming down in Jesus' name. It's coming down in Jesus' name. And we expose God. We expose every lying and seducing spirit that comes to entrap the children of the Most High God. And we shut it down. Every Facebook Live, every Instagram account, every TikTok, let it be shut down in Jesus. Shut it down. Shut it down. Expose every witch. Expose every... Expose it. Expose them. Expose them in Jesus' This is the day and this is the time that the children of the Most High God rise up boldly and unapologetically and speak against and speak against and come against every seducing spirit that is trapping the children of God. We shut it down in Jesus' name. We shut it down. In Jesus' name, we shut it down. In Jesus' name. May a bold spirit rise up in the children of God. May a confrontational spirit oh, rise up in the children of God. All right, I'm from Mount Vernon. Look at somebody real quick and say, I ain't never scared. I mean that, I mean that. Look at somebody else and just say, I ain't never scared. Because this ain't the time for us to run and hide. This is not the time for us to be fearful. But this is the time for us to speak boldly against the thing that you... Speak out. If you see something, say something. Where my New York is at? If you see something, say something in Jesus' name. I got a long way to go. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all be seated. Y'all be seated. Y'all be seated. After, after, after several days, the, the Bible says that, that Paul got so annoyed <laughs> with this woman's confession that he decided to do something about her. Now, the logical question is, why didn't Paul do something about it earlier? He, he, he could have cast that spirit out of her the first time that he saw her, but he didn't. He could have cast that spirit out a day after she was dealing, he was dealing with it, but he didn't. Why would Paul wait several days, the Bible says, before finally dealing with the bondage that was in this girl? Now... I want to be clear, the Bible does not explicitly, it does not explicitly tell us why Paul did not deal with the spirit in this girl at the onset. But what we do know is that Paul is on a mission. Mm -hmm. And the mission is clear. The mission is to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to as many people as possible. To preach salvation in the name of Jesus only. That is the mission. Somebody shout the mission. So what we see is that Paul, help me God, Paul exercised great restraint in not dealing with what was not his mission at the moment. I'm about to raise a mature church. Paul understood something. He understood that there would be backlash, that there would be consequences to him casting this spirit out of this girl and it would immediately cut his time short in that region mm -hmm. it's the very same reason why Jesus would heal people and then say see that you would tell no one because he understood that if you say too much it's going to cut my time short mm -hmm. so Paul 
Paul could either exercise his spiritual authority and cast out this demon prematurely or he could exercise spiritual restraint, self-control, and remain committed to the mission that he was sent to do. And some of us are having a hard time processing what I'm saying right now because you would need to cast out the devil right away. But just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. God, that's better than y'all saying amen. Paul would eventually get the opportunity to cast out the devil. But the message of the cross would outlive the moment with this girl. I'm not getting it. Sometimes we are so eager to prove what we can do that we miss doing what we were called to do. Just because I can do it doesn't mean I was called to. Jesus, let me help somebody because they mad. Jesus did not cast out every demon he came in contact with. And we know this because if he did, the whole world would have been free. And so, yes, we want to see everybody free, but it takes discernment and wisdom to know when and where. And the question that you've got to ask yourself, there was a time when I was younger where everybody would say WWJD. Y'all remember that? What would Jesus do? What you really need to ask is what did the Holy Ghost say? And did you even ask him? Look at your neighbor and say, did you even ask, bro? Some of us are so consumed with our own abilities as if you got it for yourself that we operate in our gifts and our talents without even consulting the Holy Ghost. Is this what you would have for me to do right now? Oh, God, thank you. And so when the time was right, not when he felt it, because trust me, Paul knew day one what the problem was. But when the time was right, Paul turned to the spirit, not the girl. Paul turned to the spirit and commanded it to come out in Jesus' name. And watch this. And immediately, the spirit came out. Look at somebody and shout immediately. Immediately. Come on, shout it immediately. There was no fighting. There was no striving. There was no wrestling. There was just a command. And then there was a response. All right. (laughs) And I didn't intentionally turn this into a deliverance sermon. I just went where the text and the Lord told me to go. But I want to insert this right here. Help me, God. Stop all that wrestling with demons. That ain't a part of the process. You tell a demon what to do in Jesus' name, and by the authority of Jesus, it bows down to his authority. I ain't tussling with no demon. The goal in all of that, I'm trying to teach you something. The goal in all of that is that demons want to intimidate you. And they want to make you doubt the power of God that is on the inside of you. But you have authority in Jesus' name. Everybody who got the Holy Ghost just said, I got authority in Jesus' name. I didn't say all the deliverance workers. I didn't say all of the ministers or the elders. I said everybody who got the Holy Ghost, shout, I got authority in Jesus' name. Luke the 10th chapter verses 19 to 20 it says behold I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy here's the part and nothing shall hurt you nothing 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 look at somebody and shout nothing verse 20 it said nevertheless do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven the 
listen because your name is written in heaven because of the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in you the Bible says that the spirits are subject to you and I refuse to fight anything that's subject to me come out in Jesus name oh God I'm about to get stuck again come out in Jesus name let's do a practice real quick huh? open up your mouth and make a declaration in this room that everything not like him comes out in Jesus be careful be careful be careful be careful some of y'all said that and you didn't mean it but I wish somebody with boldness would just say everything not like him come out in Jesus name I wish you would be bold enough to say even if it's in me oh God even if it's in me come out in Jesus name come out let me tell you something I don't have just power over the demons in you I don't just got power over the demons in you and what's in me goes free even if it's in me you come out in Jesus name and you come out quickly and you come out quick come out quickly okay 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 so much ground to cover okay sit down y'all sit down sit down sit down we're gonna get there we're gonna get there Oh, Jesus. But her, her, her spiritual freedom, her spiritual freedom caused Paul and Silas's physical imprisonment. Her physical, spiritual freedom caused Paul and Silas's physical imprisonment. The girl's owners didn't take too kindly to them freeing their slave. And they were triggered to attack. They weren't they weren't just thrown in jail. They were beaten by a mob with rods first. Okay. This is terrible news. In John, in John chapter 10, verse 32, <clears throat> Jesus answered them, them being the Jews that were about to stone him to death. Jesus answered them. He said, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Sometimes you will be persecuted for doing what is right. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you will have to take a stand even though the results might bring you to your knees. Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12 says this. It said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom heaven it says blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my falsely on my account it says rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you i i could be triggered to mourn over this but he said, rejoice and be glad, God. Another translation says, rejoice and be exceeding glad for, for great is your reward in heaven. I know, I know there's a lot of preaching and teaching about how we live our best lives down here. I know we want five steps to the best days of your life. I know we want four steps to true happiness. But is anybody glad that there's a reward that is waiting for you in heaven? heaven I know I know I've come that you might have life that you might have it more abundantly I'm grateful for that but what I also recognize is that down here is not the fulfillment of that abundance but there is a reward that is waiting for me at the end of this for some of y'all y'all shout more over the stuff down here than you do on your eternal inheritance somebody was happy about the fact that I'm going to heaven and there's a reward that's waiting on the other side for me 
First Corinthians the ninth chapter tells us that there are people that are running for a corruptible crown right down here. But we have something that is incorruptible. It cannot be taken away from us. We have an undefiled inheritance that does not fade. If you can't bless the Lord for that, I feel sorry for you because you don't know the fullness of your inheritance in God. But for those of us who recognize that we are sons of the most high God and because of that, I've got a sure thing look at somebody and shout I got a sure thing and maybe the problem is some of y'all don't even understand real salvation because you still working to get there but there's a few of us that recognize the day that I confess Jesus to be Lord the day that I put him in my heart God that was the day that I crossed over into everlasting life I'm not striving to get there I'm not working to get there I'm not hoping to get there in fact he told me that the Holy Spirit had sealed me until the day he sealed me until the day I get there he sealed me he sealed me anybody grateful that that your salvation is a done deal Somebody's theology is being challenged, and I'm glad about it. So, all right, I got to finish. So Paul, Paul and Silas are wrongfully in prison. They are in prison for doing what is right. And easily, easily, Michelle, easily, it would almost seem right for them to be angry about what they just experienced. It would, it would seem justifiable almost if they had some form of resentment based on what they went through for the cause of Christ. I, I would even argue that, that you could almost understand if they felt abandoned by God. They have done his will. And doing his will is met with violence and imprisonment. Most of us would agree that Paul and Silas had a right to be triggered. And they were. Paul, but Paul and Silas weren't triggered to complain. They weren't triggered to murmur. They weren't triggered to quit. They weren't triggered to never trust God again. They weren't triggered to abandon the church. Uh-oh. Paul and Silas are triggered to praise and to pray. I wish we had a few people who said, I don't care what's happening. I understand that the things that are happening around me, they're real. They're real circumstances and there's some tough situations. But I've been triggered to praise and I've been triggered to pray. I wish I had about a hundred people who would jump up on your feet and say, I've been triggered to pray. And I've been triggered to praise whatever my lot. You taught me to say it as well. With my soul, I've been triggered to pray, and I've been triggered to praise. I wish you would think about one crazy, ridiculous circumstance that you're going through right now, and let it provoke you to praise. Come on, provoke. Let it provoke you. It ain't all good, but it's all good. It ain't all good, but it's all good. Some of y'all will catch that later. I've been provoked to praise i've been triggered to praise while other people are triggering to lash out being triggered to lash out while you're being triggered to anger while you're being triggered to panic attacks i've been triggered to bless the lord at all times and his praise it shall continually 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 be in my mouth i want to wrap this up at 16 25 to 26 about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Give me an audience, give me an audience. Give me an audience to praise. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and watch this part. Everyone's bonds were fastened. Paul and Silas prayed, but everybody got their freedom. Paul and Silas prayed, but everyone got their deliverance. Paul and Silas prayed, but everybody got their breakthrough. What would happen if 
to 250 people in this room and 100 online would open up your mouth and pray. Give him glory, give him glory, give him glory, give him glory. I've been triggered to praise. I've been triggered to praise. I've been triggered to give him glory. I've been triggered to give him honor. For the rest of my days, I've got a made up mind to bless him. I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing. I'm a blessing. Look at your neighbor and make this declaration. Tell him I may go through something every now and again. But despite what comes my way, I've already decided I'm going to give him hope. I'm going to give him glory. I'm going to give him glory. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let Mount Zion rejoice. And let the daughters of Judah be glad. It's another unnamed woman. It's a group of them. They're just called the daughters of Judah. I wish I had some women who would open up your mouth and give God glory. Come on, Judah. Come on, Judah. Open up your mouth and set some people free. I've come to realize that my praise ain't just for me. That my worship ain't just about me. But when I open my mouth, something shifts. The ground begins to... The ground begins to shake. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Now shake the walls in this place. Open up your mouth uh, until chains rattle. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Open up your mouth. Prayer and praise triggered their freedom. Prayer and praise triggered their freedom. Prayer and praise triggered their freedom. Now, I don't know what you've been stuck in. I don't know what you've been stuck in. I don't know what you've been bound to. But the Lord sent me here to tell you that you've got the ability to shake yourself loose. Come on, open up your mouth. <laughs> Only if you believe it. 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 There's some of you that while you're praising them here, there's some things that are happening in your home. There's some of you while you're praising them here, there's some things that's happening on your job. There's some, there's some things happening in your community here. While you bless the Lord here, don't you let nobody minimize your praise. Don't you let nobody minimize your praise. You ain't got to add nothing to it. You ain't got to add nothing to it. Paul and Silas, all they did was pray and praise. No strategy came from heaven. There was no download. There was no work involved. All they, all they did was praise pray some of you you've been working just a little bit too hard and the power was always in my mouth the bible says that the power of death and life it lies in your own tongue i gotta go i gotta go but one more time only those who believe it can you release a roar in this place that lets every demon know you ain't playing no more I ain't playing with you. I ain't playing with you. I ain't playing with you. You've been coming for my kids. I'm not playing with you. You've been coming for my parents. I'm not playing with you. You've been coming for my church. I'm not playing with you. You've been coming for my money. I'm not playing with you. Open up your mouth and release a sound that makes demons flee. It's a strategy. 
It ain't emotionalism, it's a strategy. If I gotta be triggered, let my triggers free others. If I'm gonna be triggered, let my let my triggers free others.